Today I am joined by Professor Gary Habermas. Good afternoon to you, Professor Habermas. Well, Paul, I'm glad to be with you. This is a good day. It's a good day for an interview, especially uh, going across the, the pond. So looking yeah. for a good time. Absolutely. Okay, so today then, um, I'd like us to begin with the historicity of Jesus, and I'd like to ask you sure. three questions along this line. And so the first question I want to begin with today is, was Jesus an invention of the Roman Catholic Church invented centuries after he was supposed to have lived? Yeah, uh, um, somebody wrote to me yesterday and they said, which of these questions about Jesus are cutting edge and which of them are on the outskirts? And the question they asked was, could Jesus have come from another planet? You know, and I, and I said, look, look, I said, there are questions and then there are questions. Uh, whether Jesus existed itself is a fringe question, but it's, it's a big enough fringe that it's worth discussing. Whether Jesus came from another planet or whether he was an invention of the Roman Empire is so far outside of the scholarly guild yeah. that, that I'll bet you if you started writing to people, liberals, conservatives, or in between, you would get a lot of chuckles and very few people to even be willing to discuss it. Mm. It's an interesting one because it's it's what I see most on social media. And of course, social media has such an impact today. It's the question it that is. keeps on, or it's not so much a question, it's a comment that keeps on coming up that Jesus is just a fabrication of the Roman Catholic Church, which four, five, six hundred years after he was supposed to have lived. And so it's one of those questions that's often on the minds of people who will be viewing this today. They, they, they will deem it as a very serious um, kind of accusation. Yeah, you, know, you know, Paul, I, I, um, when I hear things like this, I wonder what's behind these radical things for which there is not a speck of historical evidence. Yeah. And I try to look at it like this. Saying that they're bad questions doesn't make them a bad question. Mm -hmm. And as you said, they're popular whether they're bad or not. Yep. Okay, but why do scholars scoff at them? And why do people who have never studied this outside of talking to their buddies over a pint or something, why do they think these are such good issues? And, and one of my only thoughts is, the side that denies that Jesus existed hardly has anything historical to say. Yeah. And sometimes I think that the wilder ideas stick because, A, there's nothing else to say. The bases have been covered. Hmm. And secondly, there are no data for these positions. So why don't you say outlandish things? that are meant to scare and propel and anger rather than things that are grounded. Because yeah. what you don't have with those kind of questions is historical grounding. Mm. Saying that the Romans made it up and it was invented, what, 300 years later? You know, during Constantine, there's another one you go, you know, when yeah. the Romans did it, but it just, in historical terms, and I'll just make one comment. The difference is the extremely early data that atheist New Testament scholars think can be traced to a year to two years and maybe even weeks after the crucifixion. Mm. Forget Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I mean, they're still early by historical standards. But the things we can say historically from just days to a year or two later is that alone is 10 times more data that anything that can be made for alien Jesuses and Roman Jesuses and Roman Catholic Jesuses, and by the way, that's not to be blamed on the Roman Catholic Church. Somebody else, the Roman Catholic Church would be appalled. Um, you know, it's blamed on somebody else. So yeah. I, I just think where these things go, I think Christians should learn to say, all you've done is make an assertion. Where are your 10 points of data? And by the way, since you ask me, for first century evidence for what I say, how about you give me 10 points of data for your Roman Jesus invention? Give me 10 points, not Bobby says so down the street for me, but how about this textual example, this piece of archeology, span this bit of evidence? And I'd like him to be in the first century 
And according to your own standards, you won't allow Mark from plus 40. So I would like all your evidence, come to think of it, to be within 40 years of the cross. You have to go by your own standard. Okay, and I'm going to shut up and let you give me your list of 10 evidence is fire. And here's what you're going to probably hear. Oh, I didn't say I could do it. I'm just saying this makes sense as a, yeah, this made sense as you were sitting in your living room last night thinking about this. Not that you have data. It, it kind of bugs me because yeah. these comments bother a lot of people with no good reason whatsoever. Anyway, okay. that's enough. Okay, that's the about all deserved. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right. Um, but on the flip side of that, there will be people who are who are watching this and they will say, well, I OK, I believe that historically there was a good man called Jesus and perhaps he had a little following. But is there any credible historical evidence to show that not only that he did live, that he had a huge following? He was a, a miracle worker. He operated within Judaism and that the stories of his death, burial, resurrection, and miracle stories are not just fabrications of a later period. Yeah, it's it's sort of like, as opposed to the theses we just asked, things like invented 300 years later, we could take any one of those questions you just asked, yeah. and, and I could give the same lineup that I asked. Let me give you several reasons in the first 50 years. Okay, I'm, I'm ready to do that. But sometimes it's better to see that skeptics who are non-christian new testament scholars they've got phds in relevant fields to new testament theology classics archaeology but they're agnostic or they're mm -hmm. atheist or they're super skeptical i saw a reference recently by one of them that 100 percent of scholars now that's an overstatement on their part but they say 100% of accredited scholars think that Jesus healed and exercised. Now, they could even say, well, we don't believe in demons, mm. but we think that the things the Gospels say happened where everybody thought there was a demon there and the man thought it was cast out. The actual incident that's recorded in this or that Gospel, it or something just like it happened over and over. And they'll say 100% of scholars agree with this historical framework, especially mm. for Jesus being a healer. That's conceded today by the skeptics who are non-Christians and in the right field. Why? That tells you it's a world apart from the people who get, go after these things. And on the resurrection of Jesus, I go back to the comment I just made. Mm. You have scholars, I'll, I'll use the names. Uh, an atheist New Testament scholar like Bart Ehrman, a German atheist New Testament scholar like Gert Ludemann. These names, Gert Ludemann says that the stories of Jesus' appearances circulated immediately, immediately after these experiences, whatever the experiences were, the stories spread immediately. Try that on against a view that says, well, 300 years later, maybe these guys were sitting around and thought, dot 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 yeah there's no comparison to the amount of data for what you're talking about and that's why historical jesus that general topic that's why it's the hottest topic in new testament studies today hmm. okay so you you're saying that even agnostic or atheistic scholarship is saying that jesus um well he performed whether they believe in miracles or not but he was a healer he was an exorcist he had a large following and the death burial and resurrection of jesus well, the death, burial, and the empty tomb of Jesus um, would be confirmed by these men and women? I would say a goodly percentage all the way up to their figure of total acceptance. Wow. I mean, I, I could just put a bunch of facts out there. The feeding of the 5,000, for example, okay. is, the, is, the, uh, is told in all four Gospels. That does not count for four sources. The way the critics count sources, since it's in Matthew, Mark, and uh, Luke— and since they, they think that Matthew and Luke got those from Matthew, the way critics think, uh, Mark, I'm sorry, that they got it from Mark. Mark is one source and John is one source. So that's what you call multiple attestation. We have two early sources for the feeding of the 5,000. Mm -hmm. And that's how they build these things. And you have references outside the New Testament, secular. And often a comeback is, whoa, 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 time out. You're wanting me to believe what New Testament scholars say, but they're Christians. And I'll say, uh, you don't listen real well, because the guys I just cited 
were atheist, agnostic, and skeptical New Testament scholars. They will say to you, Gert Ludeman, Bart Ehrman, if I understand these guys, they will say, we are not Christians. We're telling you what the data say. Like, mm -hmm. like Bart Ehrman says, we don't say something, when I quote a New Testament verse, this is Bart Ehrman, he says in his book, Did Jesus Exist? He says, when I quote a New Testament verse, I don't say it's true because the verse says so. I say it's true because the texts I'm using are accredited, multi-attested data from a very early date. I'm doing Jesus the way you might do Winston Churchill or George Washington. We do that the way we do normal history. And we talk to people. In fact, Bart Ehrman makes a really interesting comment. He says, people say, well, you're using prejudice sources. He'll say, wait a minute. If I'm doing a book on the American Revolutionary War, and you say, don't cite pro sources, so are you telling me I cannot talk to about any British or American participant? Are you telling me they're all out because they all have an axe to grind? That's not how you do history. And this is an atheist New Testament scholar. So playing the rules of, that historians use we have way more data than we need to discuss each of these topics, including the resurrection. Mm. What about, uh, just a thought that's popped into my mind, uh, early Christian art and early Christian symbology. Does that have any role in this, like early Christian paintings or that they wore a cross or anything like that? Okay, uh, yes and no. Um, most of the early archeology span is later. Okay. So it's gonna come in the catacombs of Rome it's going to show up in artwork, maybe from the 4th century or 3rd century. But there are things that in the broad field of art, maybe like archaeology, uh, here's some examples. Did we discover the bone box of one James, the brother of Jesus? And did it say on the outside of the box, like the co-authored book by New Testament scholar Ben Witherington and Jewish scholar who just unfortunately passed away, but... Uh, ben co-wrote his book, uh, and the name of the book is, uh, is uh, it's on Jesus, Jesus the brother of the Lord. And they decide that the ossuary that says, it, it, it reads from right to left, that's how the language reads. But it says, James, son of uh, Joseph, brother of Jesus. And, and uh, Ben Witherington asked the question, and Herschel Shanks, he's the Jewish co-author. The editor, by the way, uh, up until his uh, passing, he was the editor of Biblical Archaeological Review, a very well-known uh, archaeological journal. And Ben makes an argument like this. If Jesus wasn't at least believed to have been raised from the dead, if they, he wasn't at least believed to be, why would the family who buried James, if this is his ossuary, and they're arguing for its authenticity in this whole book, why would they still be claiming the name of Jesus if about 63 AD, where this ossuary dates to, that's 33 years after the cross, yeah. um, why, that's before the Gospels too, according to these critics, why would he, they still be claiming the name for Jesus on James's ossuary if James for the past 30 years wanted nothing to do with him? Hmm. By the way, we have multiple attestation for James being a skeptic. Hmm. So, why is Jesus' name on his ossuary if that's in fact what it is? So we have those. Also, Larry Hurtado, um, an American, I think, but he served for years as the head of the uh, religion department at Edinburgh U University. And uh, Larry, unfortunately, passed away with uh, leukemia just uh, uh, a, a year or two ago. But he did a lot of things on early graffiti as far as scratchings on ossuaries Hmm. and on early funerary literature about prayers to Jesus that go back to the 30s AD. Wow. That's some of these indications of worship. Now, right away you say, worship? Well, wow, that sounds like a theological reference. Well, yeah, and, it's re and it, it reflects historical views of people who would pray to Jesus just a few years after the crucifixion. So, yeah, we do have that data. Most of it's late, but there are a few early examples that are very evidential. Mm, it's fascinating, really interesting. I want to move on now to the self-identification of Jesus. And one of sure. Jesus' favorite identities for himself, or one of his favorite titles for himself, 
was the Son of Man. Right. Now, a lot of people take that to mean that he was just claiming to be human, but I think there's more depth to it than that. Can you explain what the term Son of Man means for our audience today? Yes, that's a really good question. <clears throat> Son of Man, a, a definition of Son of Man can come in more than one form. In the book of Psalms, what is the Son of Man that you pay any attention to him? Uh, son of Man is the son of a physical man. Mm. So, Son of Men would be men or more generically uh, humankind. Okay, now in the book of Ezekiel, Son of Man is a prophet. Almost 100 times you hear this phrase, prophesy, O Son of Man. So it's used in a prophetic context of a prophet. But the most enigmatic one is in Daniel chapter 7, where Daniel says, I saw a vision, and in the vision, the Ancient of Days, who Christians would call God the Father and Jews would call God, mm -hmm. the Ancient of Days is sending an individual to earth called Son of Man. And his job is to set up God's kingdom. And here's the crazy mm -hmm. thing. This Son of Man figure is pre-existent. Yeah. Well, how do you know it's pre-existent? Well, he didn't call up some man from Israel in 30 AD. He's sending him before the birth of Jesus. So this this person is called in the in the critical literature, even Jewish literature, he's called a pre pre existent figure, existing before his earthly physical life. Further, that son of man in Jewish literature that now I just have just seen recently is being dated to the third and fourth century BCE, before Christ. Wow. Um, he's, it's being dated to the third, anywhere from the same century of Jesus, first century, we, you know, old days we'd say AD, all the way back to the third to fourth century BCE. This, these books are of Jewish origin. And the Son of Man, two important things, he is worshipped and he occupies the right hand of God. He's sitting on God's throne. Now, it's often said that calling yourself the Messiah will not get you killed in, in Jewish thought, because in some of the Jewish commentary, you could be, you could be a Messiah and be a human being. Yeah. But you, you could be the son of God, too. But calling your, saying you can sit on God's throne, right. And in Mark 14, where Jesus is, he's asked, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And he says, he says, yes, ego me, he says, yes, to Son of Man, yes, to Son of God. Hmm. And then he changes it, henceforth you'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds and seated on the right hand of God. Now, if he were only saying, yes, I'm the Son of God, and by the way, I'm a man too, I think the high priest would have said, oh, okay, 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 we know you're a man. Can you emphasize this Son of God part for us? But when Jesus said, I yes to Son of God, and affirmed he was a Son of Man, the, the high priest went ballistic. And, and of course it was, it was symbolism, yeah. but he tore his garment, which indicates blasphemy. What was the blasphemy? Calling yourself the Messiah? No. Blasphemy, most New Testament scholars think, is when he when he claimed to be occupying God's throne right. and coming on the clouds, which in the Old Testament is always a reference and a prerogative only of God. So that's how he got himself in trouble. But the but the Book of Enoch, pre-Christian, non-Christian, Book of Enoch, says he's worshipped and occupies God's throne. Right, so right from the beginning, whoever this figure was that they were proclaiming, he is this pre-existent, what we would say, divine figure, mm -hmm. is right there in the Jewish literature, right. before Christ, before Christ, which is which sets the table for Jesus calling himself Son of Man more than any other title. Okay. So let's um, establish where we've got so far. There is credible historical evidence and data for a literal Jesus living in the first century who healed, who performed exorcisms, who died on the cross, was buried, and the tomb was found empty. 
He referred to himself as the Son of Man, and he self-identified as the Son of Man. And I just want to take this now one step further, because somebody might turn around and say, well, Jesus just thought of himself not as the Daniel figure, but just as like Ezekiel or as a son of God like um, or a son of man like Adam was. So can right. we take that one step further? Did Jesus himself actually believe that he was the divine son of God, God incarnate? And if so, what evidence do we have for Jesus's self-identity from Scripture? Yeah, well, <clears throat> If we could roll out some of the things I've already put on the table and just come back and emphasize a couple. Yeah. Um, so son of man can mean one of three things. A mere man, a prophet, or this pre-existent figure who's acting on God's behalf. And by the way, the book of Daniel itself, Daniel 7, ends with the comment that he will be served. This son of man will be served. In in some translations that word is translated worshiped and you go back and you look it up and it says no it says served but here's the issue in the greek old testament the septuagint Mm. in the greek old testament that word is latruo latruo is used over a hundred times and every single time except i think once it is yeah it's serving but it's sir he's served in a worship context it's a temple word hmm. and it's used in a worship in a temple context so back to daniel 7 that son of man pre-existent son of man is served in a sense of serving serving a divine figure okay so daniel is a jewish book by that i mean before you ever get to the first gospel it's a jewish book the son of man is very specific and exalted how do we know jesus tapped into the daniel son of man and not the ezekiel or the psalm son of man yeah. okay here's the reason twice he paraphrases the daniel 7 passage and applies it to himself and one of these two times is the one i just mentioned before the high priest which i I think I think Mark 14, 61 to 64, I think it's the clearest self-identification that we have of Jesus in the Gospels. If someone said, what's the best uh, verse? I wouldn't, so many Christians go to John 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am. John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. You know, not only is that the latest Gospel, you're okay using John, it's still early for hi- for historiography. But not only are you using the latest Gospel, both those verses to me are a little bit they need a little bit of explanation remember the jewish hearers thought how can you be the how can before abraham was you're not even 50 years old so they missed this point Mm -hmm. i and the father are one all right some people tried to stone him there but jesus had already said a husband and wife are one Mm -hmm. so in in what sense are you meaning this but in mark 14 61 to 64 are you the christ the messiah the Son of the Blessed One, the Son of God. Jesus says, I am. He changes the subject to Son of Man, says the Son of Man, coming on the clouds, seated on the right hand of God. And I could just see the response. Every time got to a higher crescendo of anger. And finally, I say anger. I don't mean craziness. I mean ceremonial anger. I mean the kind that makes you rip your clothes and say, ha, you've gone over the line. You've gone over, I got you, I got you. Because he turns to, the high priest turns to the crowd, I mean, not the crowd, but the, but the group of elders, and says, what should we do? Has he committed blasphemy? And they say, yeah, he's committed blasphemy. Now, I want to be really, really clear. Um, I am not speaking against the Jewish people, quote unquote, or the Jewish people kill Jesus. No. Or I just saw this in print recently where they said, we're being called Christ killers. Not at all. I'm only talking about an historical framework of what happened. If if Rome had to been the main culprit, Jesus wouldn't have been crucified because the Jews didn't crucify. They That's stoned. Right. That's right. So the fact that he was crucified shows without even the thing about Pilate and Herod, without even those accounts, it was a Roman decision to crucify. Yes. So, you know, Jesus might have been getting a little bit too hot for them, you know, a little bit too hot to handle in whatever terms. But it's plain that when Jesus cites that phrase, Son of uh, Christ, 
two, son of God, three, son of man, four, coming on the clouds, five, seated on God's right hand. It's like the high priest is saying, dude, you've gone way over the line on this one. Let's just stop right there, because I, I think you've sealed your own fate. What do you all think? Yeah, blasphemy. All right, over. I think that's what happened. But to your direct question, he paraphrases Daniel 7 there, and he paraphrases Daniel 7 uh, one other time. So we, it's clear to us what he means by son of man. Hmm. Absolutely. So with Jesus, um, obviously he was raised within first century Israel. This is a Jewish culture. They had the Tanakh, the Torah. They had the oral law. And if we go back to what we call the Old Testament, but what Jewish people will call their Bible, the Tanakh, uh, scattered throughout their Bible are prophecies or predictions of a coming age called the Day of the Lord. It's quite a violent age. I think many Christians today call it the tribulation period. Um, after this, there is also something called the kingdom of God. And in the Old Testament prophets, it's described as an exaltation of the land of Israel, almost into a mountain. And that from the top of this mountain, the, the, the Shekinah or the Shekinah glory of God will radiate over all the earth. And the whole earth will enter into a kind of state or age of real blessing of God. Um, and to head this up was the Messiah, the Messiah figure. Now, did Jesus believe himself to be the king of this coming kingdom of God? Yeah, look, that, that's a great question. It's amazing. We haven't you know, discussed these questions ahead of time, but you're asking some things here that are kind of right on the money. Jesus' number one proclamation, the thing he said the most. Now, again, I love to cite skeptics because I'm, t I'm tired of today's skeptics saying, you're just citing fellow Christians and you're citing the New Testament, and that's garbage. I want to know what the skeptics are saying. So, okay, let me cite one. Rudolf Boltmann. The German New Testament scholar who was to the left, I think, of Bart Ehrman, the present atheist New Testament, best probably best known in North America anyway, New Testament scholar. Rudolf Boltmann was a very famous German skeptic who died in uh, 1976. And <clears throat> even a Boltmann and others would say Jesus's central proclamation was two prongs on the same topic. The topic, kingdom of God. The two prongs, the kingdom is coming, and, and I'm paraphrasing this in today's terms, but secondly, what you do with me determines your relationship to that kingdom. And you say, well, okay, so there's going to be a kingdom like you defined, yes. And yeah, but where do you get this Jesus' boss in the kingdom kind of stuff? Well, if you only go to John, the Gospel of John, almost 100 times, we're told to believe, 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 believe. Now, that the Greek words for believe don't mean, I believe I like strawberry ice cream better than any other ice cream. Mm -hmm. I believe uh, so-and-so was the president of the United States or the prime minister, whatever, uh, the director of this movement or that movement. Um, I believe. No, in Greek, pistuo, or the noun uh, pistis, the word means to jump in with both feet. Okay. The word means to commit. The word means um, all on board. It means uh, you bring your whole self into this. And, and you know, it's amazing that in Old and New Testaments, the relationship between God and his followers is likened over and over to a groom and a bride. The father is the groom and in the Old Testament, uh, Jews were the bride. Hmm, Israel, and yeah. in the New Testament, we call we say the bride of Christ for the church. And when when Israel went astray, or when Paul is talking about Christians rebelling, in several passages, the words that are used are marriage infidelity. The, so so the, the the scenario is marriage. It's like, well. How do you come to Christ? Well, did you say I do to Christ? Well, well, what do you mean? Are you asking me if I think he's the first president of Israel? No, I'm not asking you that. I'm asking you, what did you do with Jesus? Because in New Testament terms, jumping in with both feet means I'm your guy. I'm following you. And you go, well, that's John. That's John. John's all about belief. 
What about the synoptics? All right, the synoptics say it a little bit differently, but here's how they say it. Take up your cross and follow me. Hmm. Whoever has picked up his cross and followed me, and then and the disciples say, well, we followed you. What do we get in the deal? And Jesus said, whoever has followed me, preferred me, there you go again, preferred me above father, father, mother, sister, brother, and followed me, and this world will be blessed a hundredfold, and in the world to come will have eternal life. But they both have in common, jump in with both feet and say, I do, you know, I do to Jesus, like you say in marriage, or take up your cross and follow me and leave everyone else, prefer me above everybody. Mm. What they all have in common is these two things. There is a kingdom, yeah. and you better get on board, and you get on board by jumping in with both feet into w- with me and my message. Mm. So that's Jesus' number one teaching was the kingdom of God and how to get there. Yeah. Sorry for that long explanation, but it's no, it's, great. it's pretty it's pretty neat the way it's unpacked in terms of marriage. I mean that it really is commitment. Okay, so this will carry on as a bit of a carry on um, kind of question to the answer you've just given, and it'll tie in quite nicely actually. We come to John chapter three. We have this great Jewish rabban called Nicodemus. He comes to Jesus at night, and he says that we know you've come from God uh, because of all the miracles that you're doing, so on and so forth. And Jesus responds that you cannot enter the kingdom unless you're born again. And this shocks Nicodemus because um, like early, early Jewish belief was that all Israel, Pharisaic belief was that all Israel has a share in the age to come. Even if you're the worst of sinners, you still had a portion in the kingdom of God. And another quote, I believe, is that Abraham himself sits at the gates of Gehenna to snatch any Israelite consigned there too. So should you accidentally slip into hell as a Jewish person, Abraham will snatch you out and you'll be fine. So Nicodemus had this view that all Jewish people, if you were born a Jew, you would gain automatic entrance into the kingdom of God, even though it may be of a lesser or greater status. Jesus comes along to him and says, actually, no, you're wrong. You have to be born again. And this shocks Nicodemus. Now, why did this shock Nicodemus? And what was Jesus talking about there? Well, <clears throat> I think Jesus was telling Nicodemus, just to extend from the comments I just made. Yeah. I think Jesus is saying, um, we're not dating here. We're getting married. Hmm. So if you want to jump in, my Greek professor same chapter, my Greek professor used to translate John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, who for whomsoever commits himself to him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I think he's saying to, to uh, Nicodemus, birthright is not enough here. Mm-hmm. We're talking, are, have you joined the group? Have you punched your, I don't want to say punched your membership card. That's way too parochial, but sure. we get the idea of, I, I love the phrase, I do. I think I think uh, Jesus is asking Nicodemus, are you on board? Are you on board? Because, you know, you know we have a, a, a secular fantasy, uh, The Wizard of Oz. Mm. And the, the theme of The Wizard of Oz is stay on the yellow brick road no matter what. And as the way it starts, Dorothy jumps onto the road and stays on it, but she's not on it. She has to step on it and move. Yeah. And I think the picture is, once we get on this path, Pilgrim Progress, it's a path. Mm-hmm. All these images, Book of Hebrews, Chapter 11, they were all seeking a city whose building and maker is God. It hasn't come yet. I think what they're saying is, even if you haven't seen it, get on board, follow, and to use the imagery in the, in the Wizard of Oz, there's going to be some trees throwing apples at you. There's going to be a big guy with an axe. You're going to go into the darkness of the woods where there's lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. And then you get out the other side, and there's these, whatever they were, they, plants, daisies, whatever, oh, yeah. Yeah. that would put you to sleep. And, and here's the key. When, you, when it puts you to sleep, you need your buddies to come over and pull you up and slap your face and say, here, I'll carry your basket for you. And Because we're working together. It's the body of Christ. So you get this whole idea. Mm-hmm. But the whole idea of Wizard of Oz is no matter what happens, stay on the yellow brick road. And remember, all the little people are shouting at her as they're walking, stay on the yellow brick road. And, they're, and what are they looking for? 
the Emerald City. Mm. It's, a, it's a lot like a secular Pilgrim's Progress, a yeah. lot like Hebrews 11. I think that's the key. It's a progress, and I think Nicodemus is being shocked to be told that he's got more to do. Um, to whom are you saying yes? Are you saying yes to a concept, or are you saying yes to a person? Because, again, I emphasize... The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is the key. That's the Christian gospel. But we're not saying yes to the facts. We're saying yes to the Jesus about whom the facts are true. Yeah. Uh, just one one quick example. When you say I do to somebody, you don't marry good looks, smart, good personality, fun to be with. You say I do to the person who has those characteristics. Yeah. And when you say I do to Jesus, it's the Jesus who is the Son of God, Son of Man, died on the cross for our sins, was buried, rose again, and he's leading us on the road to the Emerald City. Hmm. So I got this different idea of take up your cross and follow me, as he says. So it all works together, and it, who he is is part of this, do you know who you're saying I do to, hmm. to and are you following? That's a new, t and someone might say, well, that sounds like good works to me. Well, that's kind of a crazy response in a way, because when I said I do in marriage, nobody jumps up in the crowd and says, good man, you just said good works towards your wife. You'd say, no, I made a commitment to my wife. It's very much jumping in with both feet in the sense of making a commitment to the person about whom these characteristics are true. Yeah. That's what believers are called to do. Nicodemus was a little bit shocked that he was calling them, being called to make that commitment. That's amazing. Just as an aside, do you know whether The Wizard of Oz was written by a Christian? Is that right? Uh, no, I, I was asking you. I don't know. Oh, I have no but, idea. Because I, I think with, with Dorothy, wrong, right? she had the um, the ruby slippers that took her home. Now, whether that's a symbol of Christ's blood or not, I don't. I'm not sure. I have no idea. But but you know, to me, the idea of an emerald city. It's interesting that in the Book of Revelation. Uh, the descriptive verses in 21 and 22. Mm -hmm. Whenever people can say, oh, the, the, the city coming down is metaphorical, or the city coming down is physical, that's uh, all missing my point. Yeah. My point is when they describe what this is, about one third of all the descriptive verses are colors and stones. And so when we say uh, the Emerald City, that's not far from the biblical picture. Only, only the New Jerusalem has multi. Remember, every every uh, doorway, every entrance was a stone of a different color. It was a foundation. The streets were gold. It's very much in terms of stones and colors. Mm. And I think that that, you know, Christian or non-Christian, somebody who makes a, writes a story like Wizard of Oz or Pilgrim Progress, they're using very deep-seated imagery yeah. that we can relate to. And in this case, it ends up in the last two chapters in the New Testament. Yeah, it does. One final question, if that's okay. And uh, it kind of centers around the gospel message that you've already shared with us. And uh, the question is maybe uh, more of a philosophical one than a theological one. But why did God choose faith or pistis or adherence to as the means of salvation rather than good works? Well, you know what? I, I'm not sure we're told exactly what's in God's mind here. Yeah. However, if we use marriage as the example again, doesn't that maybe give us a little hint that jumping in with both feet in a total heart commitment is more important to God than to, it's it's the second greatest command when the when the lawyer the the legal expert asks him. The second greatest command is love your neighbors yourself in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Doing unto others is very, very high in Jesus' economy. However, it's number two. Number one is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. It's a mental jumping on. It's a commitment. So I'm just guessing that that's in a Jewish way. If the heart is not an organ, if the heart is our full selves, I think God, I think we'd have to argue that God wants us more than he wants what we do. Mm. And he even goes as far as to say what you do isn't going to get you there. It's it's your heart regarding me. And for John, it's belief. 
Now, the Synoptic Gospels say believe, too, but you've got things like pick up your cross and follow me, and we don't think of that, you know, again, we don't think of saying I do in a marriage is good works. We think of commitment. Yeah. All of mine is yours, and all of yours is mine. We are sharing. And I think that's, and you know, that's a great picture of 1 Corinthians 12 and the body of Christ, too, what happens when you come into the body. So salvation then basically is all about a relationship rather than about trying to earn your way there. That's why it's based on that. Commitment. Not only is it, yeah, not only is that true, everybody who is reading my things, they know that I'm somebody who loves history. I love historical events. I love historic historical events, I would say, as much as anybody does. It's, my, it's just, I love the topic. And yet, we're not saying I do to a concept called deity. We're not saying I do to a concept called died for my sins. We're not saying I do to a concept like buried. And we're not saying I do to a concept like raised. We're saying I do to the person, person. about whom all those things are true. This commitment idea, whether it's Jewish marriage, Christian marriage, the Old Testament, the New Testament, that image is so deep, the one of commitment and belief, which is the New Testament meaning for, for the word belief. Uh, I, I think it's inbred there for a reason. I think that's God's heart. And again, I go back to that lawyer. What's the, two, what's the greatest command? And Jesus said, well, you know, what do you read? You'll love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. That's number one. Mm. You jump in with both feet. Oh, and by the way, number two, get out there and, and work with your neighbor. From this point on, uh, you know, that's where Jesus, after he tells the parable of Good Samaritan only in the Gospel of Luke, he says, go and do the likewise. Mm. I, I tell people, going and doing likewise is extremely important because it's number two. The only thing that more important than number two is number one. So what are you doing with the Lord? Have you said, I do? You know, if you say, I do to husband or wife, that's going to issue out into uh, works. But if you say to your your sweetheart, you're engaged, you're betrothed, you're dating, you're whatever, and you go, I would really like to marry you. I'm going to go wash your car and see if I can do something else to help you. What? Well, that's very kind. But I think the other person would have a disconnect between your being sold out to me and and your very nice thing of washing my car. You know, it's uh, it's wow. I like your heart in this matter, yeah. and it just seems to be the picture of the whole Bible, Old and New Testament. In fact, you know, several New Testament writers argue that even going back to Abraham, pre-Jewish state, the the key was on belief because yeah. Abraham, yeah, he got up and left his father's. Um, land but if he didn't believe if he didn't he have a gone. prior act of commitment he wouldn't have gone mm -hmm. yeah that's wonderful that's thank wonderful. you so much for today and it's been an absolute kind of once again another feast of knowledge and you've answered all of my questions and i'm sure many many people are going to benefit from this uh from this video so if people want to get your resources where's the best place to find your books or literature or materials well there's two places and neither one of them has to do anything with spending a penny. I, I don't want to be involved with saying, oh, yeah, go buy my books. My books are available on all, <clears throat> anywhere online or a lot of bookstores. The two places just to see a bunch of lectures <clears throat> would be my website, GaryHabermas.com, or my YouTube channel. Go to YouTube and put my name in. There's over 100 lectures and, and like this one and short little snippet, 10 10 minute things to two hour things on YouTube. Nothing's for sale on either site. So I hope there's plenty there on topics like doubt and topics you discussed. How do we know Jesus is a miracle worker? How do we know he claimed to be deity? How do you know he really died for by crucifixion? What's the purpose of death by crucifixion? What about, how do we know he was buried, mm -hmm. raised? How do we know he appeared? Anybody can say he appeared. How do we know he did? Uh, I'm interested in you saying, this comes back to anywhere from a day to a year or so after the cross. How do we get back that early? Many things on both those sites that are all available free of charge. Absolutely wonderful discussion today and I'd uh, love to do it again in the future. So Thank God bless you. you. Enjoyed it very much. Thank you. While you've been watching Compelling Reason, I'm Paul Lyndon Burtwell. Until next time, God bless you.